So thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Um, so as Mark said, we're going to do an introduction to machine learning, um, kind of the formalities. Um, I'm Brian Updegraft. I'm a senior software and engineer here at Intellitech. There's all my contact info if you want to um, berate me later. A little bit of background on me. I've been coding for almost 20 years now, about 14 of that professionally, and I've kind of done some stuff in all the spaces pretty much. You know, I've done full stack web development, I've done some mobile, some desktop, some games. I kind of, I like dabbling in different techs. And, you know, so when I was presented with a machine learning project, I was pretty excited about that. Um, I want to get a disclaimer straight up front. I'm, I'm not an expert in this subject, um, but I want to try and use that to our advantage. And uh, it, this can be a pretty complicated topic and, you know, and some of these guys that are, have been in it for a really long time, uh, it can be a little confusing for beginners. So hopefully, since it's, I'm not too far out of that really steep early learning curve, um, we can, I, we can make it a little more relatable. Um, so the idea here tonight is to really kind of get a primer that's not too overwhelming and just to kind of give you that, that first step into understanding how these systems work. Um, so straight up, what is machine learning? Um, there's, you know, if you ask 100 different people, you're going to get 100 different definitions. This is one I like. Uh, teach a computer how to learn to act like a human by feeding it inputs from real world data and observations. And unsurprisingly, the key word there is learn, right? Uh, and that, that's really kind of what sets these ty this class of algorithms apart from kind of normal computing the way we would think about it. Because uh, they can they they're stateful and they can they modify themselves based on the results of previous executions and so these are very iterative processes um, in the broad sense there's kind of two categories of machine learning um, yeah, first you have unsupervised and this is less common um, because it, it's a, this is a little bit kind of just um, Black box. We're not. We're telling the computer to try and find just anomalies in data without really giving it any insight into what we're looking for. Um, so it, it's not as useful for a, as, as many classes classes of problems. Uh, one kind of example that you know this gets used among other um, techniques, but this is used partly in like um, detecting credit card fraud. You know, looking for ano anomalous transactions and that sort of thing. Um, far more common is supervised, and we're going to focus on that tonight. And the, the idea between a, or about a supervised algorithm is that basically we give it some insight as to what this data means. Um, it doesn't necessarily understand the, the meaning of it, but it, it gives us a way to like correlate um, data. Um, so machine learning isn't one thing it's this is actually a pretty much an umbrella term right and so that can make it a little more confusing um, it's it's a very it's a broad category there's actually quite a few different methods that kind of fall under this um, technology and because of that fact there's there's no one size fit all uh, fits all algorithm right it's different types of problems are better fit to different types of machine learning algorithms uh, so, and these things can get complicated. And when I say, I mean, they can get complicated. <laughs> so my first tip is don't panic. Uh, this is very much eating an elephant, right? Uh, you, you need to take it one piece at a time. And you probably, if, if you're getting into this, you probably have some type of problem that's interesting to you. So my advice would be to go and really kind of get that kind of defined up front because then you can find information about the specific types of algorithms and the specific tools that would be best fit to that. And you can kind of grow from there. Um, you know, there's just so many options. Thankfully, smarter people than me have sorted out like the math involved in some of these things. And so it's, um, but there's still quite a bit to learn just in what out, what options are available and how do you leverage them. Um, so this, let, just want to talk briefly on the kind of the state of affairs. Where are, where are we at with tooling uh, for this sort of thing? And there's a lot of options. There's everything from you know the big players like Google and Microsoft to random third parties. Um, this is a pretty. 
the I'm, I might be dating myself a little bit here, but like this feels a lot like the early days of the web, and where you know you're going out and you're grabbing random. There's not these straightforward, big codified solutions. You're not going and grabbing a React or an Angular or something necessarily. It's it's a lot more spread out and a lot. Um, more broken up. Thankfully, the situation is getting better. Like uh, big players like Microsoft and Google, you know, they're putting a lot of money and a lot of effort into making machine learning not only better, but making it more accessible to everyday developers. But it's, a, it's even within like Microsoft and Google, there's they still have uh, uh, several uh, machine learning offerings. And so that kind of muddies the waters even a little bit further. So it, it's it's getting better, and this is definitely you know there, the reason there's a lot of a uh, lot of different options here is because this is a really exciting space, and this is you know really growing this kind of new hotness. And so you know it's going to I think it's going to be a little while before it kind of boils down to some really standout options. But uh, so I'll talk briefly just about uh, a few of like the major. Tools like some of these names you're going to run across if you uh, if you start looking into machine learning. Um, so these are like some of the lower level tools. Um, TensorFlow you can't search for machine learning without coming across the name TensorFlow. Um, it's made by Google. It has a ton of community support. It's probably the biggest framework out there. Um, part of the reason for that is it has good mobile support because like anything machine learning you do on your Android phone, it's powered by TensorFlow. Um, have Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit, which un unsurprisingly for Microsoft, they changed the name. Um, it used to be called CNTK. <laughs> um, so anywhere you see out there, uh, this is pretty much going to be called CNTK, right? Um, but know that that's, those names mean are the same product. Um, develop and kind of also like Microsoft in standard form, like a lot of developers say it's uh, stronger at certain types of tasks, it's faster, it's better engineered than TensorFlow, but it's not as popular and not as well marketed because Microsoft. Um, the, the last year's PyTorch, this is my Facebook and it's newer and it kind of takes a different approach than like TensorFlow. And so there's a lot of community support growing for it. Um, but it's, it's, it's gaining popularity, but it's still a little bit newer. Yeah, yeah, so the, a lot, I hear a lot of good, like a lot of people like PyTorch for sure. Because it, it it's a lot better at solving certain classes of problems than, or a lot easier to solve certain classes of problems than like a TensorFlow model. So PyTorch, um, does that mean it's Python language? Yeah, and so we'll actually, all of these are basically like, Python is kind of the main language for, uh, for machine learning, um, it's starting to come to some other some languages, but really that's kind of the big, the big player. Um, so we've got Keras. So this kind of, these kind of are a little bit higher level, where TensorFlow and the, the like their lower level tools. Keras is it's a little bit it's more approachable, and it's kind of a layer on top of TensorFlow and CNTK to make it a little more accessible. And then we even kind of come up to an even level with Azure Machine Learning Studio, um, which I think is really cool. It's actually a, kind of a flowchart-esque um, kind of tool for building machine learning models, and we'll actually go over him more here in a couple minutes. But there are so many more options out there. I could fill 10 slides with the, the tools out there. So these are just kind of some of the big players, um, but and some of them might be better at solving certain types of tasks. Um, so to gentleman's point, my next tip is to learn some Python. I know this is a .NET group. I'm a C-sharp junkie, you know, but the, the fact of the matter is that most, at this point, most machine learning tools or demos are Python oriented. Um, there are some tools for other languages. Um, we'll, you, if you haven't heard about it yet, you probably will soon uh, about ML.NET, um, which is a toolkit Microsoft's putting together to do machine learning in C-sharp natively. Um, they're coming along, but they're not really there yet. I think e even if you just spend a day and understand the basics of how uh, Python works, it, it will help your comprehension quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to do a little demo using Azure Machine Learning Studio. Um, so full disclosure, um, 
I have shamelessly stolen this example from Microsoft. Uh, <laughs> um, I went to make one myself, and I, but I've really found that they did a really good job of distilling kind of down the basic concepts you need for any um, machine learning model. Um, so I'm like, I'm just going to use their example. Um, said, so what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be um, predicting the price of a car based on some historical data. Um, and before we jump into the demo, so I want to explain for any machine learning, to train any machine learning model, there's kind of three basic steps we have to go through. Um, first, we prep our data. And machine learning algorithms can be kind of sensitive to, uh, a, to malformed data and that sort of thing. So we, we gain, our, get a, gain a lot of advantage by kind of cleaning up and standardizing our data beforehand. Um, then we're going to train the model, and that's actually like our iterative process where we pass the pass our data into this uh, iterative algorithm that learns how to um, analyze it. And then in our final step, we score our model, we evaluate it, and we see, um, okay, how well did it do? Okay, so next we're going to do a little demo using Azure Machine Learning Studio. And full disclosure, I shamelessly stole this example from Microsoft. Um, I actually went to make one myself, but found that they had actually done a really good job distilling the machine learning concepts, so I just decided to use theirs instead. Um, and the model we're going to be building is um, a pretty basic one to predict the price of a car based on some historical data. And before we get into it, um, at a conceptual level, kind of regardless of what method you're using, um, we kind of have three basic steps we go through to, to build a, and train a model. Um, first, you have the prep phase where we go through, we clean up our data, we um, normalize it. And really, the, these algorithms can be pretty sensitive to, um, to data that's not uh, very uniform. And so we usually have to go through a few steps to do that. We have the training step, which is where we, th that iterative process where the model learns from the data and, and gets smarter. And then finally, we have our scoring phase, or our evaluation phase, where we kind of measure how well it's done. Um, so I'm going to jump over here. So I'm just here at studio.azureml.net. And if you just search for Azure ML Studio, you'll find it as the first thing that comes up. Um, so we're going to make a new experiment. And like I said, this very flowcharty looking environment here. We'll give it a nice name. Group demo. Okay. Um, so if we look over at our data sets here, um, you can see the Microsoft provided quite a few samples, which is really nice because um, data getting a good data set it can be one of the hardest parts about building a machine learning model. And so um, if you just want to get in and play around, it's really nice that they have have provided quite a few though obviously if you were doing this in a real world scenario and had your own data you can create a data set of your own and put it in here so in our scenario we're going to be grabbing the automobile price data and first thing i want to point out like if you right click on that little output node there and you can do this on any node um, there's a visualize option uh, which is really handy and we can see you know this is our data in pretty much like a spreadsheet sort of format so first step in our prep phase here, we want to, um, we're going to filter out a column. So we drop a select column node in here and we connect them. Again, very flowchart-esque. And we're going to go and uh, we just want to remove a column here. So we want to start with all of our columns. We're going to exclude our normalized losses. Now, we can right click on here and you would expect to see the, the visualize here because i said it works for all the nodes but it's grayed out in this scenario and the reason for this is because we haven't run the model yet um, it doesn't know what the data looks like in that step and so we'll just come down here to run and hopefully it should only take a few seconds okay and it finished excellent and now when I look, see visualize is available and that our normalized losses column, which was right here, is now gone. So a couple other steps we want to do here. So we want to clean some missing data. 
Um, like I said, so these algorithms can be really sensitive to um, missing data and um, malformed data and that sort of thing. So um, this is a pretty common step. So for any column here in our example, uh, we just want, if it's missing data from any column, we're just going to remove the row. Okay. And then finally, we're going to do another select. And so here we're going to pick what we call features. And features are basically just the properties of our data that we think are good predictors of what we're trying to predict. Um, and instinctively, we actually know this if you've ever bought a car, right? Um, we know that certain certain properties of a car are a better predictor of their price, right? The make, the model, the year, the number of miles, that sort of thing are all better predictors than say the paint color, right? So we're going to go and just pick out a few columns that we think are good predictors. And this is where like some of kind of the, the data science aspect kind of comes in, right? We don't necessarily like in the, in our scenario, we know, you know, certain things are likely to be better predictors and others, but in some data you may not be as clear, and so this can take some experimentation. Um, so we're just going to go and grab a few of our columns. Make body style. Okay, so notice here we actually have two properties in our data set for um, miles per gallon. And well, instinctively, you might think you'd want to put both of them in there, but they're actually pretty related to one another. And if we did include both of them, basically we'd be telling the model that miles per gallon is twice as important um, as any other property, right? So we're just going to pick um, one of those columns for our scenario here. Okay, so now we're done with our preparation phase, right? And so we're going to get on to training. And for training our data set, right, ultimately what we want, to, we want our model to be able to predict, uh, predict a value based on uh, things it's never seen, right? And so it's possible uh, if we, we, so we, as the model trains, right, um, it, it, does some evaluation against the data it has to see, okay, how well did I predict? But ultimately, it can, um, if we're not careful, it can get really good at predicting things it's already seen, but not be any good at um, predicting values that, um, predicting a result for a value it's never seen. Um, and we actually call this overfitting, right? So what we want to do here, we we ultimately we need a set of data that's um, kind of set aside that the training that the models never seen during the training process to evaluate against to see how well it's doing in kind of like a real world scenario and the most common way to do this is to simply take our data set and to split it apart we're going to take most of it and send it to the training and then we're going to save a portion of it for testing after the fact so they provide us a handy little split data node here. And so basically we're just going to take the data that came out of here and split it into two piles. And so we're going to say, so 75% is going to go in the left pile, 25% is going to go into the right. Um, it is a randomized split in this scenario. So, you know, every time we run it, it would be random though it is um, seeded. Um, as a quick aside too, um, you can actually put comments on each of your nodes here, which is probably a great idea in a real world scenario. So, um, left in. so I just did that by um, double clicking on the, um, the node. And now that we can see, hey, we expanded out, we get our comments here. Okay, so now we're going to go and pick, we're going to set up our training, and 
Um, we're going to pick an algorithm when we do that. And there's two for, for a supervised learning model like this one. Um, there's two major categories of training model. Um, there's a regression, which is good for getting a number, right? Which is what we're going to use in this scenario, right? Because basically we're looking for a decimal value. We're looking for a price where, or there's classification, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is more for picking like pre from predefined categories of values. Um, so we're just going to use a simple linear regression model. And so we need a node for that. And Okay, so you know our train model takes two node takes two inputs. The first our algorithm, and then our data set. And we'll notice we still have um, a warning our values required. So we need to go tell it what column are we trying to predict. So what what property are we trying to predict based on our results here, or based on our data set? Um, so now we need to go run this guy again and we can see what it does. Again, it should hopefully only take a few seconds. You can do it. We're almost there. Um, one thing to note here, like if I had run this periodically, it does kind of cache the values as it goes. And so, you know, say I had run at the this step, right? It, it would kind of pre-cache those values. And so the next run would be faster. Um, okay, so now let's go visualize our trained model. And we get all sorts of um, very mathy sorts of, uh, of data. Not super useful to someone like me. So now we want to go and, but the information's there. So now we want to score it. We want to see how well did this thing actually do, right? And so now I'm going to grab a score no, score model node and connect up. So here it takes in our model and it takes in our training data set and, excuse me, our testing data set. And it's going to go and evaluate the, uh, all those records that we set aside that the the training model never saw okay. we'll go visualize him again and so now we can see for each of these items right our scored label column here that's the the value it predicted right so for this guy you know this was these were the prices that it predicted based on those values which you know at a glance it looks like for the most part it did pretty good but it's kind of hard to see this in a just a big table format like that. So we're going to throw in an evaluate model node now. And go ahead and run him one more time here. Yeah, see how much faster all those ran because they were, had been run previously. So now if we go look at our evaluate model. And we get um, some nice statistical sorts of information. Now, it's been a while since um, I did took stats in college, but um, as a general rule, these things lowers smaller number is better. Um, and kind of your best at a glance is this coefficient of determination. You can think of this as like the confidence value, right? How accurate does it think it is? And so, you know, we're about 91% accurate. Um, but said, this is a good, you know, this ranges from zero to one, one being perfect. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's uh, setting a model train. I would, one cool feature that this, that Machine Learning Studio also has, which I won't go into detail here, but I did want to mention, um, they have the option down here to set up a couple of web services. Um, one, a retraining web service. So say, say we got new auto data once a week. Right. And we don't want to have to come in here manually. We could actually call, you know, have a background service go and call this retraining web service and cause our model to get um, updated. 
right? Uh, possibly even more interestingly, though, we now have this, we also have this predictive web service, and this allows us to um, just provides a normal, you know, HTTP web service we could call and pass it a, a data set, you know, pass it some cars we want to predict on and have it run against our model and then give us, you know, uh, give us a value back. Okay. So moving on. So I want to talk a little bit about image recognition. Um, there's basically uh, two types of image image recognition that you'll hear about. You have one classification. You can think of this as like we're providing one label for a photo, right? So we're saying this photo contains a cat, this one contains a dog, this one contains a bike, this one's a motorcycle, etc. Um, we also have object detection, which is a little more complicated, because basically we're drawing. Um, we're trying to identify potentially multiple objects within a photo. And so an object detection will give a bounding box. A, in this area, there is a cat. And in this area, there's a bike. And draw bounding boxes around those. Um, neural networks are everywhere. Um, if you've ever heard the term deep learning, which you probably have, um, Really, deep learning is basically a marketing term for a complex neural network. And they're just a type of learning. They're very flexible and they're very good at um, figuring out how to do things. Like they, they kind of, they, they're very good at teaching themselves, basically. And, and in scenarios where we're not very good at being able to describe to a computer in terms it understands, uh, like what what is... A thing like we we have a hard time telling a computer computer what does a cat look like or what's the difference between a cat and a dog, um, and so neural networks are very good at solving those fuzzy sorts of problems. Um, and because of that fact, uh, variants of neural networks uh, power everything we think of as uh, AI in modern life, from facial recognition. Uh, for on Facebook to speech recognition on your phone, self-driving cars, etc. These are all ultimately pet <laughs> driven. They have a neural network involved somewhere. Um, so neural network. This is a basic, um, the the most basic neural network you can have, right? Um, on the left here we have inputs, and these are these are our features. These are just like our columns were in our machine learning data set. Um, in the middle we have um, one or more what we call hidden layers and these are where black magic and calculus happens um, and on the output these are our predictions right this is what the model is saying that th these are my guesses for what the what the um, the values could be and like I said this is a classification sort of model and so we have discrete values like this would be cat and this would be dog um, so, um, and the kind of the basic, the training loop happens that, you know, we, when it trains, it evaluates the output against the, you know, what we said, okay, this thing is a dog, right? We evaluate how likely does it think it's a dog or a cat, and we either slap its hand or give it a cookie, depending on how well it did, and it goes back and modifies the hidden layer, and then tries again. Um. So you can't look at an image recognition anywhere on the web without running across the dame, um, up across MNIST. So I figured I'd mention it briefly. Um, it stands for Modified National Institute of Standards and Technology. And they actually have a couple of data sets, but the most popular one that you'll hear about, they've built this gigantic, like 60,000 or something images, maybe more, um, of handwritten digits. They're just little 28 by 28 images. Um, grayscale you know that they've cleaned up this data set for you and it's really it's often used for as kind of a hello world for or a test bed for you know new algorithms and how well can it um, handle it so you'll you'll see mnist all over the place and you know in our example here right of a neural network we see on the left you know our inputs are those pixels that 28 by 28 uh, 
array of pixels. Like every one of those pixels is an input. We've got our black magic layer, and then on the on our output layer, you know, the, we would have we would say we want ten nodes in our output, right? Uh, for every digit from zero through nine, and it would make it makes predictions on what the thing was. Uh, what the value was and at the beginning it's going to totally suck right but as it goes back and modifies it again as we slap its hand and it's going to say i think you know i think that you know 25 percent chance it was a a one and 75 percent chance was a two well it's actually a three and so we tell it it's totally wrong it's like you were way you were sort off on this one we were super off on this one and you're totally off on it being a three um so that's kind of the principle of how that would work in that scenario. Um, so because in the real world, we're not really using, you know, we're, we're not you generally working with little 28 by 28 images. Um, like our scenarios are generally more complex, right? Um, and as our needs com become co more complex, our, our solutions grow more complex complex to accommodate them um, and so you know when we hear about these deep learning algorithms right they're they're basically I said they're neural networks with a lot of hidden layers um, and they also have some other tricks involved but there's there's a lot of layers and that makes them being more complex makes them really expensive and slow to train right so you know compared to our simple little neural network this is Google's Inception 3 um, image recognition network, right? Significantly more uh, complex. And so what we have this concept that we can leverage. And as it turns out, uh, being able to tell the difference between uh, certain objects, like being able to tell the difference between some types types of objects actually te teaches some good lessons to be able to ident tell the difference between other unrelated objects and so we we've have this concept called transfer learning and what transfer learning does it allows us to take a pre-trained model and simply retrain the last little bit of it instead of the whole thing and so you know models like you know that Inception 3 model I just showed you, like they'll take that that architecture and they'll train a model using, you know, a thousand different types of objects, you know, in a million images or whatever, right? And which obviously takes a significant amount of time and horsepower. Uh, but, and we can just, because remember our, like our hidden layer is stateful, right? We can save that state. And so we can download that all of that learn download that brain right and then just go and say we're going to add our own little layer on the end of it and retrain that last little bit and it does and gives us a huge jumping off point for being able to recognize our own types of images all right so state of affairs of image recognition right uh we're even deeper in the wild west than we were with just machine learning in general. Um, the reason for this is, is that, like I said, it's it's harder. It takes more compute power, it's more expensive, so you have less people doing it. Um, but you know, the big players again are working to make it more accessible and um, to make it more affordable for us. Again, the transfer learning makes a huge difference for that. Um, it is fairly early. You know, some of these products are still in. Um, preview still in beta um, but a couple examples that are really um, handy that you can use today um, got Azure computer vision um, and it doesn't get any easier than this if if it will solve the kind of problem you have because these kinds of things like they're not customizable uh, Google has an offering or a couple offerings similar to this um, but the idea basically this is just um, machine learning as a service right it's just just an api call right and it can do a lot of cool things you know out of the box it can do ocr you can do like facial detection um 
You can do like adult content checks. You can do smart thumbnails and those sorts of things. Um, so there's, you know, for a certain class of like AI problems, right? Well, Microsoft's already pre-trained some models that are good at these sorts of things and we can just call them like an API, as a web API. Great. Um, the disadvantage to them is that, you know, like the, these models are trained for these generic use cases and not for like some specific. And so that's where, um, you know, so if you need to go and you need to be able to identify, you know, kittens and puppies apart, right, it may not be able to do that. And so that's where um, custom product like a custom Azure Custom Vision or Cloud AutoML, which is uh, Google's offering, is very similar. These are transfer learning as a service. And so um, using them, we can actually go and take build on top of their existing models and go and um, just provided images to, to retrain that last layer. Um, and again, both of these products are, I said this is early, both of these products are still in preview uh, slash beta, uh, but even in their current state, they're pretty impressive. Okay, so the project I was working on was a, I was tasked with building a reader for a an electric meter so this is not a super scientific end of things this is kind of my own personal anecdotal experiences with working with machine learning um, so our goal was we're going to read an analog electric meter um, our plan initially was to use azure custom vision to label the individual dials and our first assumption was that images are oriented somewhat normally right they're not totally upside down and backwards okay so, um, reading meter so I don't know about uh, the rest of you but going into this project I had no idea how to read a dy analog dial meter um, as it turns out it's actually pretty straightforward if you know how to read an analog clock uh, so if you were like me and don't know I'll give you a brief explanation we have a set of dials across the face each one represents like ones, you know, a digit place, ones, tens, hundreds, etc. Um, in our scenario, we're only focusing on five meter dials. Uh, so there are different types and, and there were still quite a few different models to work with. So it wasn't like we were just working with, you know, a specific brand and model of uh, meter. Um, correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like it'd be on the outside of your house. Um, so how to read a meter, right? <coughs> So, you know, if we look at our two clocks here, right, and our immediate instinct, right, is we'll say, well, the left one points at five and the right one points at six. Uh, the problem is we're actually missing some context. And both of those values actually, the hour hand means five, right? In one scenario, we're at 505, and the other scenario, we're at 555, right? So that's one of the things that makes it complicated. Um, but the, so, as you read a meter, like the dial before it provides context for the next meter, which will definitely play in to some of the complication in this project. Um, but so, you know, here's an example of the face of a meter. And so, you know, our one on the right, we've got a nine um, because we're between nine and zero, right? And just like the hour hand on your clock, right? The, the, if we're between two numbers, it's, it goes to the lower number. Right, is the one that means just like in our scenario where it's 555, even though it's kind of it's closest to the six, it doesn't matter. It's between five and six, so it's a five. Um, so like on our second number here, we're actually a three because the con our context, our minute hand on the right one here is a nine, and so now this one's a three. And if it was past, if it was a, if the one on the right was a one, well then he'd be a four, right? And these are a little hard to tell because they didn't like no. Not only are these, you know, mechanical beasts, right? So they're not perfect. Um, you know, our photo could be off its weird angles. We could have shadows and that sort of thing. So, you know, we, we really do need that context information. That is another problem we'll go over in a second. Um, so we have, so a four, a four, and an eight, right? Correct, because it's just think think about it like the clock where it was five fifty five, oh, right? Mean, if it was forty, then it would be right. almost yeah. at a five. 
Exactly, right? Exactly. So, yeah. So, no. So, so sorry. The first one would be. So, so, exactly. So, if this guy was a two, right? This guy, or a one, or, you know, if it was past the zero, this would be a four. Just like if it was a little bit past. If, if, if our minute hand was at two minutes, well, now it's six, 6.02, not. 555, yeah. The biggest numbers on the left, yeah. Why are they opposite? <laughs> the yeah, uh, that's my, I, I was curious about the same thing and uh, cursed it a few times. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, I said that my assumption, too, is that it's a mechanical, like it's just what. Ex yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it definitely complicates this problem a little bit. Uh, so kind of, you know, my initial plan here was I, I'm not going to worry about the numbers, right? We're just going to try and, like I said before, we're going to break this problem up. And I just want to see if I can get it to identify the dials out of the uh, out of the the picture of the meter. Um, <laughs> um, so I wasn't worried about the numbers, um, so I needed to draw some bounding boxes. Like I said before, we need to teach, like, machine learning is all about teaching a computer how to think like a human, and to do that, we have to tell it how a human thinks, right? And so I said about drawing bounding boxes, um, as a quick aside, you can actually do this in Azure ML, or not in ML Studio, excuse me, in, in the Custom Vision website. Um, I wouldn't advise doing so, where I found it, a, I ended up using just like a free tool called Label Image to do this, and then I could save the images. I would save them as kind of a standardized uh, XML doc, and the reason for that is then I could check those into source control. I didn't have to worry about losing all my work, right? Um, so just as I said, you can do it there. I wouldn't recommend it. I would put it in source control. Um, so I drew some boxes, and it was tedious. <laughs> He, 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 drew, he, drew, he drew a lot of boxes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, four day. Oh, that was, it, was a, it was a tough time. Uh, yeah, so we'll get into that. Um, but yes, that initially, that, yeah, for sure. Um, this was very tedious, but it was necessary. Right? So if we need, wanted to think like a human, we need to show it how a human thinks, right? So somehow we have to transfer that understanding and codify that into a way the machine can understand it. And so in the way in this context for object detection, the way to do that is we define, okay, this is the area inside the image that that object lives. Uh, and to, to Custom Vision's credit, like it, it actually did a really good job, even with a small amount of data, at being able to identify dials. Like they've got a pretty solid algorithm out there. Yeah. So, uh, yes, it's, uh, it, yeah, like it, it was definitely better at better pictures, right? But it actually did a decently good job at even fuzzy, blurry, older ones with dirt on them and that sort of thing. So, you know, the um, and again, to its credit, just like and machine, if I didn't mention it earlier, both Custom Vision and um, Cloud Auto ML, those are both like in preview slash beta at this point. Uh, I'm not sure about that in con so so the question is is you know is there any benefit to giving it bad data and there is in certain scenarios we call that um, giving it negative and you see that a lot in classification models where we're like I want to give it um, it's like I want to give we're going to give it pictures of a dog and I'm giving it pictures of a cat and I'm going to give it some pictures that are just a bunch of junk right and and that actually can help it like hone in on the specifics of those things. I haven't really heard about that in um, object detection specifically, but I could see how the concept could definitely apply. Um, so kind of my next here tip here, embrace building your data set. Um, like I said before, like prepping data is a huge part of 
of doing machine learning, right? Like having a good data set makes all of the difference. And, and simply put, if you have a specialized use case, there's no getting around needing specialized training data. Um, uh, you know, one side here is that if you need a lot of this done, there are some services out there like uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk where basically you can hire humans to do menial tasks for you. Um, and and it, one interesting point, uh, if you've ever, you know, we are all familiar like with reCAPTCHA, right? And note how it used to do like addresses and like book text and that sort of thing and now we're all we're seeing is photos of cars and storefronts and, you know, stop signs and everything. There's a reason for that. You're training this model for Google. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So next phase, I'm like, hey, okay, this thing does a pretty good job at identifying the dials. Maybe I'll throw some numbers on them and we'll kind of see, see how it does. And it failed spectacularly. Um, <laughs> it, it had, the, my first run, my first attempt, it, it had like a 20% success rate at identifying the dials with the number. Um, I mean, it's better than just a pure kind of coin flip guess, but not a whole lot, and certainly not enough to be useful. Um, you know, I kind of reasoned that there were two issues with this, but beyond just, I need more data. Um, is like we mentioned earlier, every other dial rotates counterclockwise, right? And you know, if we look at these dial images, like the big part of it, like the, we as humans, we can really easily identify, you know, we, we pay a lot of attention to the number and the dial, but it might not, right? And that data might not be uh, super clear too in those scenarios. And so I was like, well, maybe if the dial is itself, like the actual black bar part of the dial, is the most prevalent thing, then maybe I can just get it to um, to care more about that. Um, so maybe I can break up the process and, you know, so my thought was, well, maybe I can do just, I'll do a pre-processing processing on the images, I'll make the assumption that every other dial is counterclockwise, because we have to remember, obviously I know this stuff from my actual data set, but at the end of the day, like I want to be able to predict image meters I've never seen, right? So I, but I am taking, making an assumption here that, you know, if I can narrow it down to this type of five meter dial beforehand, then I can make the assumption that every one other one is. Operating. So my thought here was to go and go and flip mirror every other image, right? So at least the numbers might be messed up, but at least the dials are moving the same direction. Um, the other potential issue I saw was like, we talked about like the, those coin flip scenarios, right? An individual dial doesn't contain enough context information to really tell the difference between that three and a four, right? The context for that comes from another dial, right? So no matter how we do it, like no, no matter how good we make this thing, it's never actually going to be able to get this 100%. This has to be a multi-step kind of process. Um, so, we uh, so I broke it up into individual images and tried to just pass those as individual images, like in a classification model. So now this is where I'm passing one image gets one label associated with it, no bounding boxes, and it failed even harder. Um, Again, this is preview software, but it, Custom Vision just gave me a failed to train error with no other context. I could not figure out why. I actually got other classification models to work later, so I don't know what its deal was with this one. But yeah, so that kind of caused me to move on to my next phase of plan here was, I want to try out TensorFlow, right? And this is where my own learning a little bit about Python came in. <laughs> and it's like one advantage to at least using this. So um, Google provides this um, tool to interact with TensorFlow because TensorFlow is actually not, it's not even really geared specifically towards, um, it, it's actually more of a model on like how data can flow 
through an algorithm. I mean, it obviously is geared towards machine learning, but it's definitely not geared specifically to like image recognition. Um, so they've built kind of this Python script on top of it, so it can handle like a normal that can do like a normal image classification kind of scenario. Um, and one advantage, at least, so if I download this thing, I won't at least have to keep uploading my training images up to Azure. Um, so I, I did get that working, and the results were okay. They were, you know, we were about 48, 50% accurate. Um, but it wasn't, a, since it actually worked this time, I was actually able to test my theory about flipping the image or not, mirroring them. And I did see about a 5% improvement doing that, right? So that actually did un, end up being a positive assumption that it did do a better job if the dials were all turning the same direction, regardless of the numbers. Um, so kind of my next tip here would be um, figure out what assumptions you can make, right? These can shrink your problem space. And this was uh, one of the great, uh, great early tip I got from Kevin here at Intellitech, um, you know, and it, you know, and it kind of fits into the, what I said before about you know breaking your problem apart, um, you know, eating that elephant, right? It, it can really make it more manageable, um, you know. So at this point, like I've kind of made three assumptions, right? I'm assuming that this model at least is only going to work with five meter dials, right? It's not doing digital dials. It's not doing four meter dials. It, whatever, right? I'm assuming that there's some other step in front of this. It's going to figure out which one of those those are. Um, I'm assuming that every other dial is counterclockwise, and that again my imagers are still oriented somewhat reasonably. Um, so. My next theory was, well, maybe I just need more pictures. At least I have a model that can train now, right? And so I started doing more photos. And extra photos, as I found, I, as I did more, I found they did improve my model. Um, so I did more pictures and, and more and, and more pictures. Uh, <laughs> um, they did it very slowly. Uh, I ended up drawing bounding boxes on over 1,400 images. Yes. You could uh, you could potentially do that. Um, I think that would probably be the great. The, the, I think that's definitely like the approach I would take. Was that was the approach I was planning to take with like the um, digital meter, right? Because like okay, we we want to narrow down on that one section. Um, it actually like um, the object detection actually does a really good job of being able to pick out those dials even just from the full photo. <laughs> Sure, but so that was actually a later assumption I made because I could make the I was making the assumption my images were reasonably oriented, right? I know because my bounding boxes, like because when it when I go and predict against one of these, it gives me back bounding boxes and labels, and so now so I just sort them by their x value. Um, so I said so I drew a lot of boxes. I did I got in a lot of audible at this time. Let me tell you, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so the question is, you know, did I try and just detect this, or think about trying to detect the circles? Um, you could probably do that. That's not really a, a the, so that, that's actually probably more of a computer vision kind of solution, and that it could potentially be a type of solution. So compu the difference between computer vision and like a machine learning model, um, and there's actually some great tools out there for that, again, mostly Python oriented, but, you know, whatever. Um, like OpenCV, and they give you a lot of tools for, um, so th it's more traditional kind of computing sort of, of solutions, but they can actually be very helpful sometimes, especially like in, you know, prepping data and that sort of thing. Um, the, you know, so you, you could potentially do that. Yeah, do like a contrast check and, you know, do that sort of thing. You know, it, it's... A, a lot of what like OpenCV kinds of stuff does and computer vision sorts of stuff does, it, it would stuff be like a lot of what you see in like a Photoshop filter tab, right? And that's where those things come from, right? That's, that's like, you ever look at that and like, why would anybody ever do this in an art context? They don't necessarily, but they could put it in there because they're doing, they've already built the algorithm to go do the thing for other stuff, right? Um, so as it turned out, like actually being able to 
uh, pick out the dials from the, the greater image. I expected that to be a really complicated hard part, but it actually did a really surprisingly good job on it. Um, so, and actually that was the, kind of the next bit here. The, like, I actually had a pleasant, the really pleasant side effect of be having to draw all these bounding boxes to keep trying to test and improve this model. I now had a lot of it, training data to, for the model that could just go to try and detect the meters out of there. And it got really accurate. Like, we're talking like 98% accurate, um, you know. And so, I, Decided my process needed improving here. I was tired of drawing boxes, and but since I had all that extra, I had all that data now, and I had thrown it at training my box model, and it was doing a really good job. Um, I decided to make the computer draw the boxes for me, right? So I already have this bottom, this this model now, and so I could go and take my raw di my raw meter images, throw them, have this uh, custom vision de dial detector model go and draw the bounding boxes for me, and then I would take them out, like I would take that data and then pull, cut, cut the images out of them, right? And then do my flipping and all that. Um, so that made it so all I had to do was supply the number now. And so I figured out a way to do that way more efficiently. I built myself a little WPF app, right? And I could just load up the, and it, it made it super tuned to my workflow. So basically it got to the point where I could just 10 key these things nonstop. And if, if, it, if it screwed up an image, I just had a keyboard shortcut, I just rejected it, you know? Because every once in a while it would come up with something crappy and wouldn't work. And so I was like, okay, you're gone. And then, you know, so I could just sit there and 10 key. And as it turned out, like I said, my super non-scientific time testing, it was about eight times faster than me drawing the box. And let me tell you, I got pretty good at drawing the labeling the boxes. So that, that's way more than 8x improvement over most people. <laughs> Fourteen hundred meters. Um, uh, oh, how how many of these did I put in? So at the at the end of the day, I had about um, thirty five hundred images. So I did so. <laughs> yeah. So, but let me tell you, this process was so much better, like than than, than drawing the box. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and that was one of the things, like, you know, and, and that's where, like, if you knew out the gate you're going to have to do a ton of this, right, you know, I would definitely look at, like, the Mechanical Turk options and, you know, look at, look at some way to get, you know, an intern or something, right? The, yeah. It's like, we were looking, like, the, the, it, was, it was a little ambiguous. We, we was never really sure how many more images we needed, right, to get, you know, to, to see improvement. And so it kind of, by, by the time... I'd gotten to the point where I'm like, I need a crap ton more images. I'd already done a crap ton of images. I'm like, okay, well, we're just going to improve the process. Um, you know, and worst case scenario, you know, I could do, I could take something like this, and it would be way easier as a mechanical Turk task, right, uh, to build a little thing where they could type in the numbers instead, right? Um, so, kind of my next step in process improvement, and kind of my next pain point was the the data set of images I had. First of all, we're all stored in SQL, just to make my life a little bit crappier. Um, so I had to pull the, go and pull them all out of var binaries. Um, but the, there was not, there's not really a good hard definition on, like, you'd kind of have like a name column that had, I'd have to do a string like, and then maybe those ones would have the images I need. But a lot of times they wouldn't. Like I, I had photos from everything that were just blurry messes that you can tell anything apart, to pictures that were a hundred feet away from the meter, to someone's coworker, to the grass. Like it, it was, it was a mess, right? And so, kind of the next pain point in my process, you know, was picking out like what meters are actually relevant. And some of them too were like digital meters, right? It's like, well, I actually want to, I want those for later on in the project but they're not really useful for me right now. Um, you know, so said, not all of them were dial meters, not all of them were meters at all. Um, some of them were rotated 90 degrees with, you know, the, the way they had been taken on the phone. You know, like, uh, most of the, my, my good images almost exclusively were portrait images, and these, like, some of them were landscape. Um, and 
you know, and so I, I did. Uh, so so I, I did make another assumption there that I was like, if an image is, uh, if an image is landscape, I'm just going to try and rotate it 90 degrees. Most scenarios that actually fixed that problem for me. Um, so another good assumption that saved me some time. But so I decided I was just going to try and make. Uh, it's like my my last use of AI to help my AI, pro uh, AI project had been so helpful. I decided, well, I'm going to use a, one of these batches I'd done manually. And I'm just going to throw it at um, custom vision and try and do another classification model. I'm like, so it had maybe like 200 normal meters, like 100. So it's not even a good data set, to be honest with you. Like normally you want like fairly even numbers between, you know, like uh, uh, for each of your tags, you kind of want about the same number of images. Like this was not even close. Like so I had like 600 garbage images and 100 that were digital meters and like 200 that were the dial meters. Um, but even with that garbage data set, it managed to produce a model that was about 90% accurate at identifying a meter dial from, or a, excuse me, an analog dial from all the other stuff. Um, so, so that was, you know, so that helped my process quite a bit in that, okay, well now, okay, I can go and just pull, you know, download some of these images from the database. I'm just going to throw all of them. I'm going to rotate them if they need to be rotated. I'm going to throw them up at this classification model. And then I can take those and throw it at the dial detector model. And then now I can do my bit of manual work. And I've cut out you know, quite a bit of manual step there. Um, so my tip here is build yourself some small helper apps. Like Scratchpad coding was really helpful for me in this project. And you know they might save you some manual work. And you know one thing that I think, you know, a lot of professional developers can probably relate to. Sometimes it's really refreshing to write code that you're the only user for. Like, you don't have to make it perfect. You don't have to go and handle every stupid user exception, you know? And, you know, so it, it, and you can tailor it exactly the way, the way you want to. So it's, it's kind of a nice, nice little thing if you can do it once in a while. Um, all right, so finishing up the project. Um, so, I'd like to say that you know this was this was some grand success, but the project was put on hold. <laughs> um, client decision, you know, we're hopefully going to be coming back to it, but at the moment the project's on hold. Um, the the last version I did, I had used about 3,500 meter images, and it was about 78 percent accurate on identifying an individual dial, um, and getting better with every batch. My batches were now growing quite a bit because of my. Um, automation on the process, so I could throw just way more images at it at a shot, and so it was getting smarter um, all the time. Um, kind of my my plan to, to kind of put the pieces all together at the very end to build this, um, you know, model was like so I was going to predict the type of meter, you know, using a so since I'd had pr really good success with the the model I had built with just kind of my random pile of data, like I felt pretty confident that I could build a model now that could go and identify between different types of meters. And that could kind of be my first diverging point on deciding, you know, how, wh which model needs to go to go to for more detailed um, analysis. Um, so when we got into, you know, our analog dials here, uh, plan, you know, was to continue using the object detection model I've been using that was now really accurate. Use it to actually identify the dials themselves, and then, as you know, Mark hinted at, you know, it's like the plan was for each of the dials. I was going to go predict. Okay, r going from right to left, I'm going to predict each dial. And if I run into one of those coin flip scenarios, like in my ideal scenario, it's like my model is never going to get 100% perfect because of those coin flips. But basically, the plan was to an analyze it the way a human analyzes it, right? And it's like, if I look at the, what's my value before? It's like, if I get a, a, a prediction that's, you know, 48% 7 and 48% 8, well, it's, it's a coin flip. It basically, it's telling me it's right on the line. I don't know the difference. Um, so I'm going to use the value from the, the dial to the right of it to decide, to basically decide to be my tiebreaker. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much what I've got outside of you know answering any of the questions you guys have. Um, I will be putting. I haven't yet because I suck, but I plan to put the um, the slides and any of the references I have up um, on that address, and we'll add that to the the meetup site as well.
Um, yeah. So, you guys have any other questions? Feel free. The, so the question is, why would I try to predict the number versus predicting the angle? Um, it real I, lack of precision was the biggest problem. Like that was actually kind of one of my initial thoughts. Is like you could potentially maybe even, and some of the resources I found online, you could potentially try and solve this problem. You know, not using even AI at all, right? You could use like a computer vision sort of um, analysis for that. The problem was there just not enough precision and not and. Not enough precision. The, the photos were taken from, you know, these are just human workers out there snapping a quick photo, right? Um, you know, and so any, you know, if it's off to the side or down or up a little bit, like that's totally going to change my angle. Um, and then, you know, the coin flip scenario is kind of the same problem, right? It's like I don't necessarily, I, I don't really know where three is, right? I, I can't just base it on, you know, like cardinal coordinate kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, Custom Vision actually does have when, when you go and build a model out there, it's pretty cool. Like they have um, a couple. They have several different options about kind of what what your base model is, right? Because they have you know, and, and basically what it means like they've trained some different types of models based on different types of data, right? And two of the options they have are, or two or three, um, are actually mobile friendly ones, right? And so the, if you build it against those, you can actually go and download that model um, in, in what, CoreML, I think it's Apple's version, or um, in TensorFlow, right? And use them on the mobile. The, the problem, like, depending on your data set, like, well, you know, because I, as a test, just out of curiosity, I tried it against all of them in my data set, and it was just less accurate, and it's understandable. They're smaller models, they're intended to be faster run on lighter devices, yeah, right? I, I, I mean, I almost see it as more of a validation if the model doesn't like it, throw yeah. it out, you know, say, take it again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, and so, you know, the kind of the plan was, you know, I, I, towards the end, I think kind of what we got, what they really wanted to use it for was more of like a, um, a double check kind of step, right? And so they were going to do it offline and, you know, after the fact sort of thing. Um, and so that's where we were like, okay, well, maybe, you know, uh, technically speaking, you could use something like this from a mobile app, right? You're just going to have to, it, it's not going to be as responsive, right? Because I'm, now I'm taking this photo and uploading it and to a, an API, the API is doing this stuff. Like prediction in general is actually, in, is very fast, right? Because all the heavy lifting is done by the training step. Um, but that doesn't mean, you know, in, in real world latency, right? You know, uploading a photo, you're out in the boondocks, you know, on 2G and <laughs> might not be, it's not as nice of an experience, obviously, as running it, exactly, running it right on, you know, on the device itself. Can you do something like that and have it run straight on a device? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and so, base is said, so, like, with the, the custom vision stuff, so, so, so my TensorFlow model, right, that I was building myself, right, like I could just take that and run it on an Android device, right? There is actually a TensorFlow Lite they just started with that's supposed to be better for mobile stuff. But um, the custom vision models, and I don't know if CloudML had this or not, or AutoML had this or not. I only played with it a little bit. But um, they said, basically on the custom vision, if you built your, if you trained your model against um, one of the, the one of like the three options that were available for a mo their mobile friendly one, right? Then you could go and download your model and you just have a TensorFlow model or a, a CoreML model you could put on the device. Yeah. So did you ever think about Sure. Uh, so the question was, you know, you know, could could we basically gather data by you know doing you know going and doing individual frames on a photo, uh, you know, do a video basically on a on a meter and um, you know pull out individual frames to get out individual photos. Um, you you can absolutely do that sort of thing, and you will gain some benefit because especially if you left it out there long enough, you're going to get different daylight and that sort of thing. Um, the one of the biggest like. 
Ex yeah, exactly. It's like it, it's uh, the more variability you can have in your data set, the more robust it's going to be. The less likely your model's going to overfit, right? And so that's why you know you really want you want the junky photos with you know the dirt on them at at you know four in the afternoon as well as the pristine ones because the if you only gave it pristine ones, it's going to do great on those and fall over on the dirty ones. Yeah, exactly, right? You know. <laughs> and, and and that really is where like kind of the crux of some of this stuff comes in. Like that's like it's actually really really hard to find like blogs and tutorials out there with the, like there's tons of them that'll do image recognition, but they're all like, "Well, go download this data set of daisies, right?" It's like most people don't care. It's like, "I want to use my photos, right?" or whatever. Well, the reason they don't do that is because it's hard, right? You need a lot of data to train these things. And and it just makes this problem more complicated. So that's where you know, like just being aware going into it that Data preparation and data, you know, and having good good quality and good amounts of data is really what makes a good model. I mean, my gut is on this, and you know, I know it because we spent way more time on this than I have. Um, but like, my gut is like, if you did the circle detection, mm -hmm. you could make that a step, and then you could process tens of thousands mm -hmm. of photos sure. in a much shorter time. Totally possible, right? Uh-huh. And, so, and, and I think, you know, depending on, you know, your, and that's totally possible that that, you know, could end up being a better way. Uh, so part of what's to realize is that there's this tension that I mentioned at the beginning between when do you use algorithm and uh, when do you go use machine yeah. So it turns out we have really good algorithms for computer vision, like we've done this a lot. Mm -hmm. And so we could have gone and said, okay, let's process the computer vision first and then use yeah. machine learning to actually go detect numbers. Or mm -hmm. we could actually say, let's use computer vision or Exactly. It's like, it's like, there's certain there's certain algorithms like how do you even describe to the computer what 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 I'm looking for, right? How does that you know? Sometimes it's really hard to quantify. And I think that really brings up a good point too. Just again, it's like I, I think it's really important. Like most of these solutions are very are basically never going to be one shot deals, right? You're you're not just said so whether that you know you're you know you might have certain scenarios where the actual prediction end is one shot, but you're still doing data preparation and that sort of thing. Like the, these are almost always going to be a, a, a multi step process, and but most of that gets hidden from us, the consumer, and so we don't necessarily. Uh, we wouldn't in instinctively know that. It's more we we pass the magic box some data and it gives us stuff back, right? So, uh, I guess uh, when you think of maybe publishing one, app version 1.0, you know, mm -hmm. the technician goes out there and takes a picture of it, and then they do, you know, has the ability for them to do a correction. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, because it's like, you know, anywhere you can, if you can infuse more uh, human knowledge into the system, it's going to get better. Right. Pretty much exclusively. Right. Uh, like that, that is the single best way to improve the process. Right. Is to get more human in information, intelligence into it. Yeah. 
go. <laughs> yeah. You just got to stay one little step ahead of it, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Just be aware of the data. You know, the other part is actually running an algorithm when you go to sleep, right? It's just yeah. like yeah. It's Exactly. Yeah, exactly. By, by the by, the time you've got to the port part where the computer's doing its job, you got nothing left to do, right? You've done all the work. <laughs> it's just compute cycles at that point. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Thanks, Brian. All right. Thank you.